Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for February 20th, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to help support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting gets hosted on the Adafruit Discord server uh, each week. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, this meeting typically occurs on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday, uh, like it did this week, in which case we usually bump it to Tuesday, like we are today. Uh, in the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar, which you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We'll also send out notifications via Discord to the CircuitPythonistas role uh, when we are going to be making changes to the schedule of the meeting. So feel free to uh, add, uh, ask yourself to be added to that role if you want uh, additional pings uh, to pop up when we do change the uh, meeting over to a different day. There is a note stock that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to the document beforehand. The final notes include timestamps to go along with the video so you can use uh, so you can skip uh, use the doc rather to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 30 minutes. Uh, 30 to 60 minutes, I did that last time too. Uh, after each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can always check the pinned messages there throughout the week to find uh, the upcoming document for the upcoming meeting, and you can add your notes to that throughout the week or whenever you'd like. Uh, the meeting is held in five parts. The first part will be community news. That's a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from the Python and Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. That is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. Uh, the third part, and the first of our two round robins, is Hug Reports. Uh, the Hug Reports section is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing. It can take some time to recognize the awesome folks in our community and beyond. Uh, fourth part is Status Update. That is the second one of our two round robins. Status Updates is an opportunity to report on what you've been up to. You can take a couple of moments to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the past meeting, or what you uh, plan to be uh, getting up to for the next week until the next meeting. Uh, the fifth and final part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussion. Those discussions can come out of status updates, or they can be uh, topics identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. So that covers how the meeting will go. So I will get my scroll in the document correct, get a first timestamp, and get the community news going. So first up in community news this week, CircuitPython 8.2.10 was released. CircuitPython 8.2.10 is the latest bug fix revision of CircuitPython, and it's a new stable release. There are links in the document here that go to the Adafruit blog, uh, as well as the GitHub release notes. And there is a uh, short list of notable changes since 8.2.9, which include a fix to ePaper display garbage collection, uh, a proto argument to socket pool socket constructor uh, for allowing the specification of protocols, uh, allowing the RGB matrix frame buffer size to be more than uh, 65,535 bytes, allowing uh, allow creating a mount point on an existing directory, and then some individual board fixes. Next up from the newsletter this week was uh, CircuitPython 9.0.0 beta.1 and beta.2 were released. Uh, these items aren't in the newsletter. Thanks to Dan for adding this here. Um, these were uh, came out, I think, after the newsletter, so they didn't make it in, but they may be uh, noted in the next one. But yeah, for everybody here in the meeting, it's a good thing to know. Uh, CircuitPython 9.0.0 beta1 was released. Uh, on Saturday, and then beta.2 was released yesterday. Uh, beta.1 contains a number of significant fixes uh, since the previous beta, which is beta.0, and then uh, beta.2 contains an important fix for the Memento camera board. Uh, you should up 
up, you should upgrade your Memento to beta.2 and reformat the file system as described in the release notes uh, or the Mo, uh, Memento learn guide. Uh, and as always, uh, be sure to back up your important files before you do that. Um, next up in the news this week, uh, I don't know the proper way to pronounce this company's name, so my apologies if I get it wrong, but uh, Renaissance uh, is going to be buying the PCB design firm Altium for 5.9 billion US dollars. Uh, the Japanese chip company Renaissance Electronics Corp has set up plans to acquire PCB design software firm Altium Limited uh, for Australian 9.1 billion, which is about 5.9 billion US. The move is an extension of Renaissance's mainstream business, which is predominantly the supply of digital and mixed signal chips for automotive and industrial applications. There are links here. Uh, I don't know where that is too, actually. It says EE, EE uh, Euro News, it looks like. Uh, so if you'd like to read more on that, you can follow the link in the notes doc or this week's uh, newsletter. Uh, next up is hands-on with the Bus Pirate 5 debugging tool. The Bus Pirate is a hardware protocol analyzer used by thousands of designers since its introduction in 2008. It's been a number of years since the last iteration, but now the Bus Pirate 5 is available. It's based on the Raspberry Pi RP2040 chip. Uh, there is a link here to Hackaday and the Adafruit blog, and it says Hackaday provides a hands-on look at the latest incarnation if you want to learn more about that. A um, couple more this week. We had lots of news items because lots of uh, neat stuff caught my eye this week. So next one up is CircuitPythonista Helen Lay was featured on the uh, Embedded.fm podcast. Uh, CircuitPythonista Helen Lay joined Embedded.fm to talk about putting together conferences, including Teardown 2024, uh, indie hardware prod, uh, producers, including Crowd Supply, and building communities. There's a link here to Embedded.fm uh, embedded if you want to listen to that podcast. Uh, in the project of the week, we had a Pico and MicroPython meets Vintage Radio Shack kit. I couldn't resist putting this one in. Uh, Don Wilcher uses Raspberry Pi Pico to build an adjustable clock with an LED display and then integrate the clock with a Vintage Radio Shack Science Fair microcomputer trainer programmed to function as a 7-bit binary counter. Don adds a Raspberry Pi Pico programmed in MicroPython, making an adjustable digital clock. And uh, these little Radio Shack kits with their bendable uh, springs were one of my first introductions to electronics, so those things will always have a uh, kind of a special place in my heart, which is what caught my eye on that project. And then the last two are both a couple of notes from the Adafruit Playground, which both caught my eye. Uh, as a reminder for anybody that uh, may not know, the Adafruit Playground is a new place in the community uh, for the community to post their projects and other making tips, tricks, and techniques. It's ad-free, and it's an easy way to publish your work in a sp safe space for free. Uh, the two items this week that are in the newsletter that caught my eye, the first one was a new Playground post that talks about using the uh, web workflow with Circup, which is uh, still in beta. There's a PR out to do that, which this is a good reminder uh, to myself to finish up on some refactoring in that PR. Um, but this is really, really cool. Thanks, I believe it was, to Tyeth for writing that up uh, and showing folks how to get the version of Circup from that PR and use it to load um, libraries onto your device via the web workflow instead of USB. Uh, the other one, which I thought was really, really cool, uh, is a custom a &O fidget firmware. This is a custom CircuitPython firmware that uses the NeoPixel rotary. Uh, it's a custom CircuitPython firmware for uh, the NeoPixel rotary fidget project. Um, so head over to Adafruit Playground if you would like to see that. If you follow the link, uh, I suggest taking a look. There's a GIF in the newsletter as well, which um, is really cool to show what this little fidget device is all about. So really, really cool stuff. Uh, lots of stuff this week that was really awesome in the newsletter. Let me take the next timestamp and tell you more about the newsletter itself. Uh, the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community run newsletter that's emailed every Monday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest in Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, to contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub or submit a pull request. Uh, 
in order to add your changes. Um, you can also email to cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Macedon, Blue Sky, or uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. And thanks, uh, as always, to Anne for doing all of the wonderful work to bring that newsletter to us each week. Uh, next up is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. This section is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, the libraries, and Blinka. So first up, I will read you the uh, overall section. Uh, and also, as noted here in the uh, document, especially since we are doing our meeting on a Tuesday this week, uh, our reports here cover um, stats for like a rolling seven-day window. So uh, unfortunately, when we do the meetings on a Tuesday, it means there is one day that gets left out of the stats. So there were some stats from last Monday that did not make it into this. We do appreciate all the folks that worked on uh, anything in that time frame nonetheless, though. So for uh, overall stats, stats this week, we had 38 pull requests merged by 14 authors. Um, the names here that are newer to me are uh, KB Sririm, uh, EZR Schwartz, and let's see, Radiac, uh, Knockman, NOQ Man, and let's see, C Darius. Um, those are the names of folks that are uh, either newer or less familiar to me at least. So those might be newer contributors or less frequent contributors. Thank you to those folks, as well as all of our other more regular contributors or folks who have names that are more familiar looking to me. Uh, for those 38 uh, pull requests uh, uh, from the 14 authors, we got reviewers, uh, excuse me, we got reviews by five people, uh, mostly the usual suspects for reviewers. So thank you to all of our reviewers as usual. Uh, the more reviewers we have, the more contributors we can support. So thanks to everyone who does reviews for us. Um, we had 40 issues closed by eight people and 16 new issues opened up by 16 people. So we're net down uh, quite a bit on issues for the week. Next up, I will uh, pass it over to Scott, if you're available to tell us about the core. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Okay, so for the core, in the last seven days, so missing uh, Monday, as Tim said, uh, we had 31 pull requests merged, which is awesome. Um, we had 10 different authors, which is more than we normally do as well. So uh, just uh, thanks to Bill88T, NoQman, uh, KB Sriram, Retired Wizard, C Darius. Uh, those are all kind of newer folks for in terms of authors, so thanks to them. Uh, we had three reviewers, myself, Dan, and Jeff. We have 18 open pull requests, which is quite good for us, which is awesome. Um, we tend to want to be under the 25 pull PRs per, per page limit, so we're well under that, which is great. Uh, Issue-wise, we have 32 closed issues by 4 people and 8 open by 8 people, so we're net down a bunch, um, which is awesome. Uh, we have 662 total open issues. Uh, we track... Uh, Adafruit funded folks' prioritization on issues via uh, milestones. Uh, the milestone that got a lot of attention over the week was 9.0 because we're trying to get 9.0 stabilized and out the door. Uh, we have 13 open issues there, which is great. I think the last number I remember is like 38, so 13 is awesome. Um, we have zero open issues on 8.2x. Uh, I don't expect to see any more there because we're basically like pushing to get 9.0 stable. Uh, we have two open issues on 10.0. Those are things we want to not forget to do in the next major version. And we also have 13 open issues on 9xx. So things we want to do once we have 9.0 stabilized. Uh, lastly, we have seven issues not assigned to milestones. So we'll want to go through and triage those as well. And that's where we are with the core. All righty. Thank you, Scott. Next up is the libraries. This section covers all of the libraries which you can find uh, on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and then the name of whatever library it is. Uh, these things tend to provide either um, like drivers for specific pieces of hardware or higher level uh, helper libraries that allow you to um, create projects without worrying about as many of the low level details. Um, across all those libraries this week, we had seven pull requests merged by six authors. 
Uh, I'll uh, repeat a couple of those names. I think they were the same ones, but I don't remember for certain, and I want to make sure to call them out. The folks that have names that are less familiar to me, so these might be newer or less frequent contributors. Uh, thanks to KB Sriram, uh, EZR Swartz, and Radiac. Uh, thank you to our other more regular contributors, too. And we had three reviewers this week for those uh, seven pull requests. So thanks to myself, Brent, and Dan for reviewing uh, in libraries this week. Um, of the merged pull requests, the oldest one that was merged is only uh, nine days, and the newest uh, handful were just one day, so we were focused mostly on newer pull requests this week. After that, it leaves us with 49 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest one is 551 days, and the newest is one day. Um, in the last seven days, there were seven closed issues by four people and six new issues opened up by six people. That leaves us with 742 open issues. And of those, there are 19 that are labeled good first issue, uh, which you can find over on circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is the place that you should head if you are interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things. Um, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find a list of open PRs and a list of open issues. Uh, if you're looking to contribute, it's a great place to start. Uh, to get started with reviewing, you can look at the list of open PRs. Take a look at any open PR. Um, you can look at the code for um, spelling and syntax. If you have the hardware, you can test it out. Leave a comment on the PR letting us know that you looked at it and what you found. Uh, once you're comfortable with that, we can get you leveled up to the review team so that you can leave official reviews on GitHub. Uh, however, comments, uh, you know, leaving reviews are perfectly fine too. Um, if you would like to get started actually uh, publishing your own code, you can look into the list of issues, including those 19 good first issues that I uh, mentioned before. Um, those are going to be issues that are waiting for a person to come along and actually contribute some code in order to resolve whatever that issue is. Um, those are listed out again on that circuitpython.org slash contributing. If you want to find those, you'll click over to the issues tab and then use the drop down at the top uh, in order to filter by the type uh, or the tag, I should say, uh, to find those good first issues or any of the other tags. Uh, we do have a guide for contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. We're always available over on Discord to help folks get started, so let us know if you need assistance. Uh, don't let the process intimidate you. Uh, we want to uh, let everyone be able to contribute in whatever way works best for them, and we're willing to help uh, you know, work with you to make that happen. So uh, for library uh, PyPI uh, download stats this week, we had um, 92,730 PyPI downloads across the 324 published libraries. The top 10 list is here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at those. And uh, for library updates in the last seven days, there is a new library in the community bundle that's titled BLE Cycling Power Service. Uh, there were updates to HTTP server and macro pad, as well as uh, Seagrover's Wave Viz library over in the community bundle. So uh, take a look at those if you're interested in any of that stuff. Uh, and next up, I will send it over to maker Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, so uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had zero pull requests merged by zero authors and zero viewers, of course. Uh, there are currently six open pull requests amongst all the Blinka repositories. There was one closed issue by one person and two open by two people, uh, leaving uh, a net of 85 open issues, and there were 12,300 PyPI downloads in the last week, 11,990 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 129 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up is the Hug Reports section. Uh, as a reminder for folks, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight the folks uh, in our community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically uh, or as names appear in the notes doc. If they happen to be out of order, that's okay too. Um, if you're text only or missing the meeting, then I'll read your notes for you when we get to your turn in the list. So I will get us started after I take the first timestamp. Uh, I have a, a number of hug reports this week, so thank you, uh, first of all, to squid.jpg and Justin, who both helped me out with some color space conversion functions and math uh, on the Discord um, last week. 
Thank you to Retired Wizard and DigiDevin3 for testing out different scenarios on the Memento device to check if an issue that I noticed was reproducible. Uh, thank you to Dan and Jeff for figuring out the root causes of that issue and working on fixes for it. Um, thank you to uh, Kmatch and Jeff, as well as anybody else who has contributed to bitmap tools. Uh, I'm always finding new stuff in there that I didn't know about that is making my life easier. So uh, really, really neat stuff in there. Thanks to everyone who's made it what it is. Um, uh, another hug thanks to Dan for making new beta releases, the one that contains the new uh, board-specific stubs feature, and another for the Memento storage fix. And lastly, thanks again to Jeff for pointing me towards a way to convert uh, between RGB 565 swapped and non-swapped uh, color spaces using ULab. Um, so that is what I have got for Hug Reports. Next up is Anecdata, who's text only, so I'll read. Anecdata says, uh, Hug Report for Jeff for the embed TLS PRs to extend HTTPS server from a Raspberry Pi only uh, slow to the Espressif ESP32 S3, which is faster, and for exploring, making TLS available to non-native sockets. Uh, Anecdata has another hug report for Romkey for the PR to expose the details of stations uh, connected to a Wi-Fi access point. Next up is C. Grover, who's also text only, so I'll read. Uh, and then after that, I will we'll pass it over to Dan. Uh, so C. Grover says, thanks to Dan, for uh, Dan and the team for the release of 9.0.0 betas one and two, significant updates that represent some impressive problem solving, uh, group hug to our inspiring community. So next up is Dan, uh, followed by DJ Devin. Thank you. So uh, thanks to Jeff and Scott for, um, well, we all worked together to reduce the number of 9.0.0 issues significantly. A huge number of pull requests last week, as you saw. Uh, thanks to Foamy Guy, DJ Devin3, Jeff, Retired Wizard, and ADCC, and maybe some other people even, I'm not sure, for help with debugging the memento storage problem over the weekend. And thanks to Jeff for co-working with me on a fix for the memento problem. He found a couple of serious problems, and uh, together our fixes uh, made it very quick to publish a fix. And uh, thanks to Mikhail Pokusa for um, updating the HTTP server. There's a pull request to handle a new incompatible change to sockets that came out in beta.1. This makes sockets more like um, they are in CPython, and you have to use SO reuse adder when you're reusing a socket with the same address. Okay. All righty. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin 3, and then Jeff will come after that. Thank you. I have a hug for Lady Ada and Queryad for the Arduino TSC2046 touch driver. I was able to pull a formula from the embedded code comments in the driver for calculating analog resistive touch pressure. Even though it was for Arduino, it helped immensely. A hug to Foamy Guy for running into a hard fault issue on the Memento, and it derailed his fancy border project temporarily during the stream as he dove into investigating the hard fault. It was nice to see multiple people in the dev channel jump right into beta testing the issue with him. Uh, a hug to Dan H. and Jepler for the quick low-level investigative work to discover and fix a fatal bug in the Memento build. And a hug to Syndrome for a private collaboration on our next Matrix panel projects. We've had some excellent conversations behind the scenes, comparing notes with large Matrix arrays, and we would like to present our findings in a playground note eventually after more experimentation. All right, thanks, DJ Devin. Uh, next up is Jeff, and then I'll read Justin's notes after that. Hi there. I, on this first item, I keep growing the list, and I'm, I'm worried I'm going to leave somebody out. But uh, for everybody who was working on finding, diagnosing, and working through the whole Circuit Python drive on Memento thing, uh, I've got Foamy Guy, Retired Wizard, ADCC, DJ Devin3, Dan, and Lady Ada uh, on my list. Uh, Lady Ada, we talked to her internally, and she reminded us why uh, we made the decisions we did about partitioning that device and why it's different than the others. Um, and that has to do with Arduino. Uh, anyway, next, this morning, uh, thanks to Deshipu for a hint about why some code I was working on wasn't working. One for Anecdata for uh, prompting the idea to further generalize the core SSL implementation with the idea that maybe it could be used with uh, WizNet and add some wired Ethernet with SSL support for CircuitPython. Uh, on the circuit 
uh, on the socket rather theme, thank you to Justin for moving sockets forward. Uh, another one, thank you to IDE on GitHub for CircuitPython HTTPS server, which I was uh, using as my test bed when I worked on some of the recent SSL changes, and I'll probably use it again. Uh, thank you to Michael Pokusa for quickly finding and reporting a apparently new problem with binding SSL sockets. That may apply to all sockets. It's not clear yet. Uh, and finally, thank you to Dan H for releasing CircuitPython and probably more releases in the near future. And that's what I've got for Hug Reports. Alrighty, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up, I will read notes for Justin, and then after that is Maker Melissa. Uh, Justin says, Hug Report for Scott, Dan, and Jeff, all uh, for all of their help uh, with moving the connection manager along. Uh, so I will send it over to Maker Melissa next. Uh, let's see, I wanted to give a hug to Mikhail Pokusa for uh, improving the circuitpython.org search performance and a group hug to everyone else. All right, thanks, Melissa. Uh, and I forgot to mention that he was on deck, but next up is going to be Scott. Hello. Uh, hug for me, uh, for Bill ADAT, who had a what originally looked like a very complicated um, bug, but he, uh, re he retested it and posted uh, test code that didn't involve any other external libraries. There was a couple bugs in the test code, but it was like still very nice and concrete and had clear instructions. So thanks to Bill for, uh, for giving that easier to reproduce code for that bug. All right, that is it for the hug reports. So next up, I will take the timestamp and tell you about the next section, which is status updates. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we are up to individually. I'll start, and then we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is an opportunity to provide folks tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. Uh, if a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it down to in the weeds. So I will kick us off. Um, I had a little bit less time than usual for CircuitPython on towards the middle and end of last week dealing with some uh, stuff in real life, so I did not do as much uh, as I would have liked. Um, the things that I did get into uh, over the past week were testing a uh, change to the macro pad, which added the ability to rotate um, the display and the buttons after it was initialized. We always had the ability to do it when it was initialized, but this made it so you could do it uh, after the fact, which is kind of cool. Um, Lots of the rest of what I worked on was all related to this one project, the Memento camera project with overlays, um, trying to put frames and other neat graphics um, on top of or you know combined with the photos that you take on the Memento camera. So uh, before I actually got the hardware in hand, I built a proof of concept using an older TTL serial camera and a ESP32 S3 Feather. Um, I did get it working to combine those images. It took a bit of work, uh, but it was nice to do that even before I had the hardware because it allowed me to work through some of the color space conversions that I ended up having to do anyway. Uh, during that, I went down a bit of a small rabbit hole trying to make some modifications in the core before uh, Jeff very kindly pointed me towards some helpful code that uses new uh, ULab instead of uh, that uses ULab to do the conversion that I was trying to add new code for. Uh, so that was much easier to do. Didn't require any changes in the core. Um, I got that functionality moved over to the Memento device once I actually got it in hand. Um, in the process of that, discovered a wider unrelated problem with the storage configuration on that device. Um, once I started pasting some of the larger image files on there, I started getting weird stuff and then uh, kind of the rest is history. Um, I figured out how to do uh, the overlay in the preview uh, using bitmap tools.roto zoom uh, in order to scale that down to 75% so that it matches the preview that's on the display, uh, which is really cool. Uh, I, I'm actually quite surprised at how well it's able to keep the preview moving live, even though it's kind of uh, allocating an extra bitmap and doing that copying each time. Uh, so that's actually that was really cool to see. Um, I refactored everything into a cleaner uh, interface and submitted a PR in the Pi Camera library with an overlay property um, that allows that to be um, done a little bit you know, more easily and without the random hard-coded bits and extra print statements that I was using before. Um, so if anybody wants to take a look at that, that, that PR is in now. And then uh, my last item, which is not directly related to CircuitPython, 
uh, but I do intend to eventually use it with CircuitPython and the HTTP server library is a, a library that I published on GitHub over the weekend called uh, sql.json, which is a very, very, very basic uh, SQL engine that stores its data and reads it from uh, .json files instead of a SQLite3 or anything else. Um, that's up on GitHub, and it supports only a very limited subset of SQL syntax. I'm hoping that this can be uh, maybe like a helpful introduction to the concepts of SQL and SQL injection to people who don't have any prior knowledge of either, uh, but who may have some experience with CircuitPython or JSON data. Uh, and with that, uh, I will go next up is C. Grover, who's text only, so I'll read, and after that will be Dan. Uh, C. Grover says, upgraded wave viz to automatically adjust to synth.io waveform or envelope input object when plotting an image rather than having to set an initialization quarg. And there's a link here if anybody like to follow that and read up more. Uh, use the new version on the Faderware Wave Builder testbed to graphically show the dynamically adjusted wavetable and ADSR envelope settings. And there is a link here to YouTube if anybody would like to take a look at that. Um, next up, Seagrover says, made significant headway, serving, uh, saving and retrieving SynthIO waveform and envelope files using an SD card. The in-progress WaveStore class is designed to read and write SynthIO objects such as waveforms, uh, envelopes, and filters, as well as storing and retrieving WaveViz windows and screens. The object is to create... Uh, yeah, the object is to create, manage, and share a collection of SynthIO assets. Of course, when completed, WaveStore and the initial asset library will be placed into the community bundle. Uh, and the last one that Seagrover's got uh, says next on the list is to design a basement expansion, uh, basement expansion PCB for FaderWave that incorporates an I2S speaker, a stereo I2S stack output, and an SD card for storage. So thanks to Seagrover for those. Uh, and next up, I will pass it over to Dan. OK, so um, as already mentioned, I released CircuitPython 8.2.10 last Tuesday. That has some mostly minor bug fixes, but it had been a while since we'd updated. So there were various things, including the ability to support a larger number of panels for RGB matrix, as was mentioned. Then on Saturday, I caught up on 9.0 betas by releasing 9.0 beta 1, which includes a slew of changes, some incompatible changes, and you should look at the release notes carefully about those. I've tried to make it the incompatibilities um, really called out clearly in the release notes, uh, as, as suggested by Scott. Then, um, um, over the weekend, we also encountered this Memento um, CircuitPy drive problem. It wasn't a regression, it's just that it came up right after beta 1. So uh, thanks to everybody who helped fix it. Uh, it's now fixed, and I released beta.2 last night. Um, so as mentioned, update your Memento camera board. First back up CircuitPy. Update to beta 2, then reformat um, CircuitPy, erase and reformat CircuitPy. And that will fix the problem. So over the weekend, I did spend a lot of time debugging this issue. It was extremely confusing because there were really two bugs. And fixing one then revealed another bug. Um, it was also the case when we thought that the form file system was being reformatted. It wasn't. So that was also confusing. Uh, I updated the uh, master root certificates list, the one that's shared by everybody, to include a new root for flightaware.com. There's a, there's a Adafruit certificates is the repo for that. Um, and I uh, fixed something that I had been trying to get to work for a while, but finally finished, which is that now the build file names that are on AWS S3 um, include more information. Instead of just having the commit in them, they now include the branch name, like either main or 82x, and the PR number is like PRNNNN. So you can look at a particular build in the listing or lying around on your disk and decide that, uh, oh, that's what this is for, okay? And that may help people who are doing manual bisecting or trying older versions. And that's it. 
Alrighty, thanks, Dan, and thanks for adding extra information to those. That sounds quite helpful. As someone who has uh, clicked through that list before, I definitely think that will help out. Um, thanks, or excuse me, uh, next up is DJ Devin 3. Thank you. Uh, th this week, uh, I've been working on the XPT 2046 resistive touch controller, which I found it is just a clone of the Texas Instruments TSC 2046. Discovered Adafruit has an Arduino driver for the for that chip, the TSC 2046. Uh, Liz's le learn guide on that chip uh, and Lady Ada's Arduino driver are excellently documented. Unfortunately, there is no Circuit Python driver for that learn guide, um, so that's kind of what I'm working on is using an existing Circuit Python driver and trying to merge though that like incomplete subset with the completed one from that. Adafruit has from Arduino. Uh, I released a 3D model for the Adafruit 2.5 millimeter pitch matrix panel. I intend on submitting the model to Adafruit CAD parts, and I am currently designing 3D printed support brackets for the Fed panels. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, DJ Devin. Uh, next up, I will read notes for FedA2, and then uh, ADCC is after that. So uh, FedA2 says, I built a Zabbix library for CircuitPython. I have an unofficial RISC-V lab, which uses Zabbix as monitoring. So now I have a RISC-V board, a QT ESP32 C3, monitoring my RISC-V lab. The demo uses a NeoPixel strip to light an LED for each host, green for available, blue for load, and red for down. Uh, FETI2 also says configuring uh, HID remappers on Adafruit's USB Feather to distribute them to linguists and indigenous language teachers to test a new keyboard layout for Costa Rica before submitting it to Unicode, uh, which sounds super cool. Um, next up is ADCC. All right, thank you, Tim. All right, so this week, traded in uh, Sonoma delayed metadata rights uh, for a new FAT file system right performance regression. Researched it, wrote it up, and wrote new feedback for Apple. And you know, this new regression affects the Sonoma 14.4 betas. And continued work on BLEIO for PyGo W. Uh, wrote some PRs for minor upstream issues in BT stack and tiny USB and rebase my work in progress onto the beta one of 9.0.0. All right, thanks ADCC. Uh, next up is Jeff. Hello, I've mostly been working on 900 bugs. I filed a bunch of PRs late last week. I think most of them have been merged at this point. I helped out with the memento storage bug uh, a little bit. And this morning, I got sidetracked with Anecdata's musings about uh, WizNet SSL as to whether we could uh, generalize my work a little bit and make it work with that. Um, that's kind of in progress. There's a draft pull request out. But I think there are some things that don't work yet just on even boards that worked before. So don't go try it right now. Uh, so for the rest of the week, I really need to switch gears back to what is important for Adafruit, and that is working on this Flopsy board. Uh, I've got an early revision. Need to test that the functionality we want working in CircuitPython works. I suspect it doesn't, and that I have to update the library that does the floppy interfacing, the floppy IO module, um, and then probably some time in Arduino land. And uh, just another note, I am out or mostly out all next week. so. Probably it'll be two weeks before I'm hanging out in a meeting with y'all. And that's what I've got going on right now. All righty. We will uh, see you then. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Justin, uh, who's text only. Justin says, uh, got a chance, uh, excuse me, got a change into mini MQTT that allowed me to move forward with Connection Manager, which is now updated and ready for a full review. Uh, thanks to Justin for that. Next up is Maker Melissa. Hello, uh, so I worked on updating the Raspberry Pi Pi Eyes project. Uh, uh, it's in C code that will basically, I'm trying to get it to capture the uh, New Wayland desktop, and I and now it's successfully getting an image and at least saving it as a PNG file. I'm taking a break from that right now to update the web workflow editor to reflect uh, new API changes, and I'm working writing a learn guide regarding that. And uh, that's it. 
Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up, I'll read notes for Mikhail Pukusa, and then uh, we'll round it out with Scott after that. So Mikhail says, uh, improved performance of search bar in circuitpython.org downloads section. Preparing Adafruit HTTP server library for uh, CircuitPython 9.0.0 and working on HTTPS support for Adafruit HTTP server library. Uh, there are still some problems on ESP boards, but at one point using a specific version of CircuitPython 9.0.0, I was able to implement SSL with HTTP server. Uh, so exciting stuff on the HTTP server front. Thanks to McCall Pocusa for those updates. And I will send it over to Scott his updates hello <clears throat> okay so i had a neopixel day last week where i tuned neopixel transmission on the esp boards uh, and s2 in particular is a lot better esp32 is better as well uh, but basically we try to gre greedily grab as much buffer we can on the peripheral side um, temporarily while we do tr neopixel transmission and that's made it a lot better um, I also moved CircuitPython to Core 1 on ESP32. So ESP32 will hopefully work better when uh, because the Core 1 is the second core and the, the original core, Core 0, should be used for networking stuff. So hopefully it'll actually work better. Uh, we'd already done that on S3, but we hadn't set the setting on, S2, on the ESP32. The S2 is single core, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, I fixed some IMX UART uh, receive issues and also updated its SDK while I was a lot, uh, while I was working on it. I debugged an impossible to uh, control C on IMX and realized that if we set the CDC receive buffer to exactly as much as uh, the endpoint can have, so 512 and 512, uh, for high-speed USB is that the moment you get a single character, you no longer go back to the computer and ask for more characters uh, because you can't guarantee that you have enough room for a full packet's worth. Um, so I added a, a check there that we always give ourselves at least 64 characters of buffer um, so that if you accidentally type a thing or two into the serial connection, you can still control C. Uh, basically, the control C needs to be sent to the device so that it can see it, um, even if there's other stuff backed up. Um, as it's kind of come up, has, has come up, I changed the behavior of socket.bind. Um, it previously implicitly set uh, a flag to allow reuse. Um, that is not what CPython does, and I and the bug I was running down, I think, um, was leaking or not closing sockets as it should have because this uh, reuse behavior masked that. Um, so now uh, in CircuitPython 9, you have to explicitly request that reuse is allowed. And this matches CPython behavior, but does change the way that CircuitPython has been working. And uh, folks are making that work even better, which is great. Um, I started working on fixing uh, a crash on SAMD for Pulse N. Uh, that it, it turns out it's caused by conflicting reset mechanics. Uh, but basically, I have a, an item in, in the weeds to go into more detail there. And then last up, I want to just continue bug fixing until we get to release candidate phase, which will hopefully be soon. Um, and so we can get 9.0 stable, and, and that'll be awesome. So that's my updates. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, and the last section for the meeting is in the weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These can either come out of status updates or be uh, topics that are identified ahead of time. If you've got any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they get added to the In the Weeds section in the notes doc. Uh, we do have a couple topics there, so if anybody knows of another one, please go ahead and put it while we're discussing the Swantons. Uh, so first In the Weeds topic is for uh, Justin. Uh, Justin, are you able to read or should I read for you? No, I can go ahead and read on this one. So, um, sorry, I just have a bit of a sore throat, so limiting my talking. Um, so, as you read, so I've made some great process progress on Connection Manager. Um, feels close to potentially getting at least the V1 kind of merged in, and then basically trying to kind of figure out what next steps are going to be, um, just to try to figure out kind of plan of attack. Um, I know when we talked about it a while ago, we didn't know if we wanted to just update requests first or request in, in mini MQTT. Um, 
what help docs we want to update and things like that. Um, obviously, at the point that requests uses it, then it'll need to be added to the frozen modules for whatever it has requests frozen in. And so just trying to figure out where we want to go on that. And so I can start working or at least prepping or figuring out kind of the next pieces. So. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'll let um, Scott or Dan or Jeff, or if anybody has uh, ideas around that, I would I would mention for myself, I'm probably in favor of doing the requests and mini MQTT at the same time as, instead of trying to do them separately uh, would be my thought. And then as far as documentation, to the best of my knowledge, um, there's not a whole load of a lot of documentation, I don't think, because a lot of the projects and learn guides and things are not actually typically using mini MQTT or request directly, but a lot of them use the higher level libraries like um, PyPortal library or Adafruit IO library. So I would say uh, one um, step during testing will be making sure that those higher level libraries are either unaffected or if there is like an API change that's needed from the user code, then um, that's I think where the documentation would be around is more on that like higher level, the Pi portal and the Adafruit IO type libraries and stuff. But um, I will. Yeah, uh, and they they shouldn't need any changes other than the fact that potentially if you're using something that's not frozen, you would now have to make sure to add that library as well. So. Um, okay. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, I would say. In my mind, it also makes the most sense to go ahead and just update the the frozen ones at the same time for both of them again. Still, like request a mini MQTT at the same time would be my thought. But um, Scott or Dan or Jeff or anybody else have thoughts on connection manager next steps? I think get it in the bundle, right? So that when we update mini MQTT and requests, we already have like the new dependency plumbed all the way through. Um, and then I would probably still do a major version release just to make it clear that like a lot is changing and and you may need to install the dependency even though it's not um, doesn't require any code changes. Um, and I think I would kind of I might bias to actually doing one and then the other like maybe requests first actually just in case you find something. Um, just in case you find something in the like initial use of it. Um, that so that you don't have to go back and fix it in mini MQTT as well. And I've been playing with them both pretty extensively. Like I've got draft branches for both of them. Um, obviously, they point to a, a Git repo for the requirements. So I think yep. you know, obviously, step number one is getting that first PR approved and merged. Right. And then kind of at that point, I can open up the other two PRs, and I'm happy to do one at a time. It doesn't really matter too much to me. Um, and then, uh, I don't, yeah, we don't need to be that cautious, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So let's just, let's just get it in and released and do it. Okay. You, so we really, so get that first PR merged in, release the version that way I can update the other ones and then yeah. just kind of start moving that way. Yep. And, yeah. uh, and add connection manager to the bundle, which is basically just opening PR on the, on the bundle repo with some changes. So. Right. Okay. Is it pretty straightforward? It I haven't is. looked at it yet. Yeah, okay. it's pretty easy. There's a learn guide for it. Um, I okay. can link you to afterwards if you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. All right. Yep. Thanks, Justin. Um, next yeah, topic. Thanks for working on that. Yeah. Looking forward to that review, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't even gone through my email today, so no, no worries. We'll today, hopefully. <laughs> uh, next topic is for Scott. So up to you. Thanks. Um, so this is also primarily for Jeff and Dan, but I was running down this pulsing crash on SAMD, and I'm pulling a string that is longer than I thought it was. Um, but basically, there's a now I discovered a class of bug where the SAMD code was originally written in that dinit didn't fully well dinit did fully deinitialize stuff, but it wasn't called by a called by a finalizer. And then along came some changes that enabled finalizers for pulse in, which makes total sense to me. Um, but the problem is, is that now on reset, we call this blanket reset function, and then, we, then, then the finalizers run. 
So in specifically in this case, the blanket reset sets a ref count to zero, and then the D init comes along and decrements it and wraps around because it's unsigned, um, which causes problems. Um, so the general thing is like, the general question I have for you is, should we move away from bulk resets and only do finalizer-based resets? That's kind of the tendency, I think, for the newer APIs anyway. Um, yeah, that's kind of my gut, because then you know that what uh, finalizers are more reliable versus remembering to add a reset. I think we you know, have bugs where we forget to add the this reset or the that reset. Mm -hmm. And it just we know the same thing is going to happen either way when the heap gets cleaned up. And I think that's really a good thing. Right. When, I mean, go ahead, Dan. Uh, what, so when so the finalizer runs when the VM shuts down, like it's guaranteed right. to run then? It is, but right now we shut down the heap after we do the bulk resets so that the memory is still valid in the bulk resets. So that's why the bulk reset gets run before the heap is completely DNIT and the finalizers are run. And are there cases in which we have some severe error in which... Um, like, suppose there was a, some safe mode thing or some internal state inconsistency, then is it possible that you'd, like, exit the, the VM and... And not run it? And not run it, yeah. I don't... I don't... I don't know. I don't think safe mode will. Because safe mode really, like, you call the safe mode function... It it's sets hard a value. It, set, it sets a value and then it does the hard reset. Like okay, I think in that case that's true. I guess not safe mode. I'm just thinking that I'm just thinking about any other. Are there any other cases? I guess it's it's a controlled restart in all of the right. cases. So right, and we have most we have most of this code already because we've we've been pretty good about writing dnit so that they actually deinitialize stuff. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is that when we take something that was not finalizers but had a D in it and then change them, but we don't remove or make sure that the bulk reset is um, is like compatible with the D in it, like this is where we're running into this issue where we're like crashing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that's also interesting to think about in terms of the, and I think maybe this is like, I should file an issue for the larger like redo, but the other thing is if we move away from bulk resets, we can move away from never reset. Um, or at least to a model where the objects need to know that the finalizer should be ignored or something like that, um, rather than having these separate mm -hmm. um, like resource lists that are never reset. Um, you know, so in the case of like the the main display you create the main display and then the finalizer won't actually be run for that at all right like it will live as long as possible and and now you don't need never reset because you don't have to worry about a bulk reset coming along and and undoing its state right um mm -hmm. which is you know we've always had problems with never reset as well so, like, the work to do here is actually to look at all of our APIs and make sure that they're all finalizer-based. Um, yeah. That's the major. That's the major work, which I think I don't want to do right now for nine point because we're trying to get it out the door. Yeah. Um, I think I have to. I have to. So another thing I ran into with this is like I was, I fixed pulse in, and then I looked at pulse out, and it had the same problem. And then I realized that pulse out you internally uses a PWM out <laughs> on the on the CMD, and because it because the kind of the using class is finalizer run, then dnit for PWM out is also called after the bulk reset of PWM out. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's also a bit viral. So I think I can at least yeah. It's a rabbit hole. And I did this all on the stream last week if you want to see me do it. But I think it, if I, I have to do PWM out now, um, but I don't think I have to do absolutely everything for nine. <laughs> okay. 
Um, because the if I change PWM out to do finalizers, not only do I have to fix it for Sandy, I have to make sure that it works in all of the ports. <laughs> like switching to a finalizer is a cross port endeavor. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree not to do this for nine zero. Right, it's not, and these bugs will just linger, or we won't implement. Yeah. Right. So I think maybe I'll fi I'll file in an issue a new issue. So this shouldn't change any public API. So it's something we could probably do before ten. But like the audit every API and make sure it's finalizers, and then remove all the bulk resets and never resets is like a bigger task we could do between nine and ten. Yeah. Um, for now, I'll just do the the stuff required to fix this crash, um, yep. which is pulse in, pulse out, and PWM out, hopefully. In, in MicroPython, they just added another macro or call to create objects with finalizer or something like that. There was oh, some nice. New, there's something, some new, new thing that they added to bundle all that up together. Oh, so. great, because I did, I did notice that like there's an easy new such and such thing that's a one call that sets the base type. But for finalizer, that doesn't exist. So that's right. So he just did. Added. I think somebody just did that. I don't know who. Either Angus okay. or. Okay. All right. I'll I'll take a look at that too because it would be yeah. good to just like maybe we we do the MicroPython update and then we do the yeah like switch to finalizers, get rid of all this other nonsense, um, which is a big internal change. But um, yeah. Okay, well, that sounds like a, a good short-term and long-term plan. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Scott and Dan. Uh, with that, that was the last of our In the Weeds topics, so I will move us on to the wrap-up and get us on the road here. Uh, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for February 20th, 2024. Thank you to everyone who participated. As a reminder, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Uh, this video and, uh, excuse me, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which you can find at adafruitdaily.com uh, to subscribe to that. The next meeting is, uh, I believe, going to be uh, at its normal day and time on Monday. That's going to be the 26th of February at the uh, standard 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, that meeting, as all of them, will occur here on Discord. You can always join the Discord by going to adafru.it slash Discord. And uh, as always, if you want to be notified about the meeting on the day of or any changes to the schedule, uh, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role over on Discord. Uh, so that's it for this one. Thank you to everyone, and we'll see you all next week.